Ah, this is gonna be controversial. What's up guys, my name is Chona, welcome back to my C++ series. It's been forever since the last episode, but we're back. Today we're gonna to be talking about conversion operators in C++. Put simply, conversion operators just allow you to convert from one type to another. It seems super simple, it seems super useful, and to be honest, in a lot of cases, it is. But much like a lot of other C++ features, it can definitely be abused. What I'm gonna show you here today is some really simple examples of how you can use these to clean up your code effectively and to make things easier. I'll talk about some real world use cases for where I've used it before and where I think it fits in really well. And in the end, I'm gonna show a real world bug that we had because of these conversion operators. So buckle in, it's gonna be a wild ride. Okay, so first and foremost, what are they? Let's write one. So suppose we have a struct here. It can be a class or a struct called orange. What I can do is write the word operator followed by any type I think of, such as a float, and then have that return a float, like 5.5. .5. At its core, this is what I'm talking about. This is called a conversion operator. What it allows us to do is convert this type into this type. Very simple. How does it work? Well, if I have an orange over here, I can just be like float f equals orange. Check that out. And so if I go ahead and log that and I'll run this, then you can see I print out 5.5, which is the value I was returning here. Another way to do this is to also cast orange to a float. So if I do that as an example, you can see I get the same result as you would expect. And then finally, if you had a function that took in a float like this, for example, then you can just call print float with your orange. And there we go. This accepts a float as you can see, but because there is a conversion that exists for orange to float, then we can just pass it in and pretend it's a float. For all intents and purposes, it's like we, we could just say that it's a float. Now, why on earth is this useful? That might be the first thing you ask based on this example, this nonsensical example that I've shown here. And that's okay. Maybe you think like that because you're a beginner programmer. And if you are, I have the perfect thing for you. Brilliant.org, the sponsor of this video, which by the way, you can get started using for free. Brilliant.org is an amazing website filled with lots and lots of really high quality courses on various STEM topics. They have some excellent beginner computer science courses that they've recently started expanding. They have this really good visual engaging and interactive way of teaching that applies to all of their courses. It's a really good way to learn how to think like a programmer, but then with some of their new courses, they've actually been expanding this to include writing actual code and building programs in Python. And this great way of teaching also extends into all of their math courses, of which they have a lot. From the everyday math course that's really, really good for beginners, all the way up to advanced topics such as calculus. But again, presenting all of this visually, giving you these widgets that you can play with, quizzing you to make sure that you're paying attention and actually understanding what they're teaching you. And you don't have to take my word for it because you can just try it out yourself for free. They have a 30-day free trial that you can use to try out everything on their platform. Just go to brilliant.org slash the journal. Link will be in the description below. And if you do go on to like it, Brilliant have been nice enough to offer 20% off an annual membership using that link in the description. Huge thank you to Brilliant.org as always for sponsoring this video. All right, so back to conversion operators. How is this useful? Let me show you some more real world use cases of this. So the first example I have for you is one that is actually present in the C++ library, but we're gonna write it out ourselves. And that is a scoped pointer. So a scoped pointer, it's a unique pointer in C++. I like to call it a scoped pointer just because it makes sense that it's somewhat tied to a scope. This example I have here <laughs> doesn't actually fulfill its purpose, which technically is to delete pointer in the destructor like this. But anyway, suppose we have a scope pointer and maybe let's give it something to wrap such as this little entity struct. So if we have a scope pointer wrapping this entity. So we can set it equal to a new entity, for example. If you have no idea what a scope pointer is, by the way, then I have a video all about smart pointers. Check it out, it'll be linked up there. This class basically just means that we can automate the deletion of it because you can see that when this stack object goes out of scope, it will call delete. So we don't have to manually free this entity. So a really common thing for us to want to do just with regular pointers, like if this had just been a regular entity pointer, is to check to see if it's null. Right, and we can do that in C++ in a couple ways. The more traditional way is probably just by writing something like this. So for example, if entity is not null pointer, this is by the way, an exclamation mark and an equal sign, the ligature is just making it one. But another even cleaner way that we can write this is just like this. And the reason why this works is because of a couple reasons, potentially. The simplest explanation is just that a pointer is an integer and a Boolean is also an integer. For the same reason why this would work and this would work for null, 
this also works. Because it's an integer, we also have the ability to actually cast a pointer like this into a bool if we wanted it to be of the bool type specifically. And of course, we can also reverse this by checking to see if it is null like that. Because if the entity pointer is zero, then that of course is false and we will enter this branch. So to tie this into a, a more of a real world example, if we had a function over here called process entity and it took in like an entity pointer, then we might wanna do something like if not entity return, or if the entity is valid, let's do some kind of processing over here. Now, if we wanna actually wrap this in a scoped pointer and then pass that in over here, which in this case, you'd probably want to not copy the object for obvious reasons, because if it gets destroyed, it will delete the entity. Then we lose the ability to do this. So we can call process entity with E, let's get rid of all this. That's what our calling code looks like, but then we're not able to check this because it's a scoped pointer. It's not an actual pointer anymore. It's an instance of an object that wraps our actual pointer inside. So what are our options with this? Well, we could add something to the class, something like is valid, for example, which would just return you know, m pointer doesn't equal null or m pointer cast to a bool, whatever. And then we could just write some code such as is valid. And that makes sense. And that's great. And if you want to do that, that's more than fine. But we can actually retain the same functionality if we wanted to by just using a conversion operator. Because what if we could just treat this scoped pointer as a bool? And of course we can. We just need to write in operator bool. We'll make a const and we will return and pointer doesn't equal null pointer, or if you wanna keep both functions, you can always just return is valid inside our scoped pointer class. And now if we scroll down, you can see that this becomes valid. And for me personally, I like the way this looks. I think it makes a lot of sense and it's actually quite common. Like for example, the C++ standard library does this as well. So if I use a unique pointer instead of my scoped pointer, I'll just have to make sure that it's an explicit constructor like this, then you can see that this works fine as well. And that's because unique pointer also contains an operator bool. It's got a conversion operator that will return get does not equal null pointer and get just retrieves the underlying pointer. So for this particular case, in my opinion, it's basically a no brainer. I don't see any controversy with writing a bool conversion operator. I think it's great. Now let's move on to another example. This one's a little bit more complicated. We have a timer. It's pretty simple the way it works. We call start, we call stop, it starts a timer, it stops a timer. And then we have a couple of functions to get the timer duration either in seconds or in milliseconds. So the usage of this might be something like timer, timer, timer.start when we wanna start it, timer.stop when we wanna stop it, and then finally timer get milliseconds or get seconds if we wanna retrieve the result of that timing. And then this timer.get seconds, we would typically assign it into a double like this. Now, what we could do though, because the underlying way that we use timers is it just contains a time, which in this case we're using as a double. Why don't we just write an operator double? We could have a conversion operator into a double to avoid having to call a function. And of course you can do that. So we can just write operator double const return, and then we have a choice here, get seconds or get milliseconds. So let's just say we'll return get seconds. So now we don't have to do this. We can just use timer as if it's a double. We can pass it into any function that might wanna accept a double, and we can even do math on it like it was a double. So for example, I could have an additional timer, maybe timing some kind of other operation. And then if I wanted to get the combined time of both of these, I could just add them together and it goes into a double and everything is great and it looks nice. But here's the issue. It is a little bit harder to read now because we have two different options. We can retrieve this in seconds. We can retrieve this in milliseconds. This does not specify what it is. It's very easy for us to accidentally use this as a double thinking, well, surely you must be returning milliseconds or surely you must be returning seconds. And it ends up being the wrong thing. So we're introducing this kind of ambiguity that's making this less functional or less well functional, I should say. This is exactly a scenario where if we had just called get seconds, even though yes, it is more code and it does look less clean, it provides more information. And I think that's one of the most important things about programming. You are using the English language here to express code in a way that's not just readable to the computer, not just understandable by the compiler, but also understandable by humans, presumably. So typically you're in a situation where more is more. If your code can provide more clarity, you should do that. And it's definitely much better to do that rather than try and be cool, for example, and just use conversion operators and then have to write comments such as, this is in <laughs> seconds, by the way. 
<laughs> we don't want to do that. That That's bad. The code should be self-documenting in this case. And that's how we achieve that. And now let's switch over into Hazel and I'll show you some real world examples of where this can go wrong and go right. So over here, we have this fun little function that just displays the performance of certain timers inside Hazel per frame. So as the game engine is running, we have the ability to time certain functions and we can display the per frame timings live in the UI. And we had a bug where inside this, so this is supposed to show how long all of these functions take, we were just seeing zero milliseconds everywhere. So you can see as this is running, we're just seeing zeros. Well, if we take a look at the code, this is the code that is actually displaying all of this in our UI using IamGUI. You can see we're iterating over this previous frame data and we're also using const auto here for the actual types inside this structured binding. We're then actually writing the text in the UI using this. So you can see we're trying to use this as a float to three decimal places and we're passing in per frame data as that first argument over here. So what is per frame data? I'll check this out. Per frame data is a struct. Okay, so we're trying to treat that struct as a float, I guess. Let's take a look at what the struct is. So this is the struct. It contains a float time and it contains a UN32T samples. So this is the number of samples that it gathered throughout the course of a frame because these timers show the cumulative time of that function across the entire frame. So if it's called 100 times, it will contain the sum of all of those individual timings. And there is that operator float, the operator float that returns time. So in other words, we can just use per frame data as a float, in which case we can completely ignore this samples variable. We don't care about it. We just want to use the per frame data struct as a float and that's fine. Now, normally that would work. There wouldn't really be an issue with that. But the issue here, unfortunately, is ambiguity. The thing is, I am going text, much like printf, just allows us to specify a bunch of parameters in various types. And then since it has to accept parameters in all of those various types, it does so. If we take a look at how the function's written, it just takes in this list of variable arguments of any type. And that's really where the problem is. Per frame data can be per frame data, or it can be a float. So in this case, it's just like, well, I'm cool with it being that original struct type. There's no reason for me to convert it into a float. So therefore I'll leave it at that original type. Now, this may have worked in the past because it's possible that this per frame data, which by the way, I think was called something like time before I refactored this code on a live stream whilst I was fixing this bug. This could have originally been a float itself. It might not have been that per frame data struct, but then later on, maybe we decided to also store the sample count, the number of samples. So now obviously this had to become a struct. It got changed into a struct instead of just being a, a single float. And whilst writing this, the author may have wanted to keep this still compatible with the existing code by allowing it to be cast into a float, to be converted into a float using this conversion operator. But the problem is if you have a function that accepts both, then of course it's gonna use that original type. If it can get away with using that type without doing any conversion, that is of course the first thing that it tries to do. So my point with this is that in this case, this causes ambiguity thanks to that conversion operator. If we hadn't had the conversion operator, then no one would try and just pass in that struct. They would have to call dot time. And per frame data dot time is very clear. You're showing the time and you're showing the samples. Of course, it doesn't make sense to just pass in per frame data because what part of that data are you showing? But in the past, as I mentioned, it used to be a float. So there was no ambiguity. There was no samples. It was just time and that made perfect sense. So in this case, even though we could also achieve this working by simply casting it to a float. So if we try that instead, because now we're actually being like, no, 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 I want this to be treated as a float. Even though you can take in that other struct, I'm actually converting it myself into a float in this case. So you can see in this case that everything's working, right? We're not getting timings of zero apart from some places where it might make sense we're generally getting data now. So even though we could achieve this by casting this to a float, I would say that the correct decision here would be to simply write dot time because that makes the most sense to the human reading. And of course it works properly because time itself is a float. And finally, let me show you a recent real world example in which I used these conversion operators. And I'm not so sure if I like the way that I use them. So recently I was working on the asynchronous asset loading system inside Hazel. And so now we have a couple new functions. We have asset manager get asset async. This allows us to asynchronously request an asset by its handle. If it hasn't loaded, we're not gonna get it immediately. It's just gonna queue the load on a background thread. But if we do have it available to use, the asset system will serve us that asset and we can use it. So because of this added layer of complexity, meaning we're not sure if we're gonna get the actual asset 
that we asked for or potentially a placeholder. And if we do get a placeholder, we might want to use it, but we might just not want to do the thing at all. So if we get a mesh placeholder, let's just not render the mesh this frame, for example. Because there are now all of these possibilities, instead of just getting a ref static mesh back in this example, as we would have before, if we synchronously requested that asset, we get an async asset result. And this async asset result contains two things, basically. It contains an asset and then just a bool, a little flag that's called is ready, which basically tells us whether or not we got the asset we requested. So basically this asset is gonna be one of two things. It's either going to be the real asset that we asked for, or it's going to be a placeholder. So in order for us to know and respond accordingly, we have a Boolean just to, just to tell us whether or not this is the real one or the placeholder. But here's the thing. As I have introduced this new function, get asset async, and I'm going through the code and I'm changing it in places where it makes sense to get things asynchronously to get things asynchronously. And as I'm going through the code and I'm beginning to use this function, I'm realizing that I want to use it in a couple different ways. Sometimes I'm fine with the placeholder. I don't care. In which case I want to go through and I just want to change get asset into get asset async. So for example, this is a completely random place that I just found by searching where we get the asset synchronously. So we're just calling get asset and it gives us the text that we've asked for. I want to be able to just change this code to get asset async. And in this case, look at that. I don't have to change the type at all because I know that this is going to give me one of two things, either the actual texture I asked for, if it's loaded and ready for use, or a placeholder that I can use instead. If I had to go in and then change this to be an async asset result, and then when using it, I have to change this from texture to texture.asset, that's just, I don't like that at all. That's just not very clean. And in this case, I truly don't care which one I get. So it makes sense for me to just keep using texture, but now suddenly I'm getting it asynchronously, which basically for the calling code just means that I'm never gonna block the calling thread while I load that asset. But in other cases, like where we were before, it doesn't make sense to render like a placeholder mesh. I just maybe don't want to render that mesh at all this frame. Just skip it, render nothing until it's ready for rendering. In which case I'd have to come back here and use this is ready boolean to see whether or not that asset is ready. So I would choose to receive an actual async asset result and then I'd have to check to see if it's ready. And if it is ready, then I can call dot asset and use it. But here is where conversion operators come in and make this a lot cleaner. Cleaner, but probably not semantically more clear. In fact, the opposite. Inside async asset result, where I have my asset and is ready, I actually have two different conversion operators. We've got one that will convert this into ref of T. This is templated by the way, since assets can obviously be a wide variety of types. And then an operator bool that returns is ready, which allows us to use this as a bool. So note that I'm not returning asset, which is a ref, but the ref class inside Hazel also has these bool conversion operators. In that case, it would just be checking to see if the asset is null or not, but the asset is basically never going to be null. It's either going to be the placeholder or the real asset. So specifically here, I'm checking to see if it's ready. I'm returning is ready because if it's false, I got a placeholder. If it's true, I got the real asset. And so those two things that I showed you is ready and asset. We actually need none of them because this will call the operator bool to check to see if it's ready or not, because we're using it in the context of a bool in here. And then this will call this conversion operator and give us our asset because we're just using it as if it's an asset. And so to be honest, like it's pretty nice. We get to not care whether or not we treat it like an async asset result or just like the real asset. But if we do choose to treat it like an async asset result, we can check to see if we got the real asset we asked for and then just use it accordingly. But the problem with this is that it's not immediately clear what we're actually doing here. Are we checking to see if the asset is it null or not? That's what it appears to me at first glance. Whereas if I explicitly used is ready, that would technically make more sense. But you could argue that with the variable name here, static mesh result, you're obviously checking to see if the result succeeded in a way because it's in the name. And if you read this, if static mesh result, that kind of implies whether or not the result was successful, whether or not it gave you the asset that you wanted. And then technically speaking, even though I'm explicitly getting the mesh source here and making a new variable out of it, this function, which takes in a mesh source, I could just provide it with the mesh source result. And of course it would still work. I'm just being a little bit more explicit here because I find that that helps the readability. So yeah, this is an example where I'm on the fence. I kind of like it to be honest because it keeps everything clean, but it's definitely got a little bit of a learning curve. And I find that with C++, 
Sometimes if you can avoid having a learning curve for the way that you're using the language and every developer just understands it out of the box, that of course is a better place to be. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please don't forget to hit the like button. What are your thoughts about conversion operators? Do you use them? Do you like them? Do you try and steer clear of them? Do you hate them with a passion? Let me know in the comment section below. And while you're down there, let me know what you think I should cover next in the C++ series. I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.